Hello there, Evie here. Welcome to a water cool build and review in the Raijin Tech Sticks. Now, if you want to check out a more in-depth review of this case and maybe something more specific to air cooling in this case, then please check out the top right-hand corner. Uh, it's a much longer video that I did that was last week. Uh, it goes into all the pieces and parts of this case, all the different uh, compatibility issues that are in this case. There are restrictions to this case, so you probably are best checking that video out first uh, if you want to know more about the case specifically. Uh, as for water cooling, this video of course goes into the entire build, everything that goes into this case, uh, any restrictions specific to water cooling that you may face in terms of reservoir sizes and uh, and the uh, radiator size and that sort of thing. If you want to check out more footage like you saw just before this intro then wait for the end and there's some more b-roll footage, some nice fancy uh, music and stuff that goes along with it and if you want to check out uh, some thermal results then at the end that'll be there as well and at the end I'll also of course wrap up with a few thoughts and opinions about this case and a couple of tips and tricks uh, that I discovered during the uh, the use in this side of this case. So thanks for checking this video out, I really appreciate you uh, checking it out and uh, I've sort of ran out of words. So I'll check you out in a second for the main part of the video which is of course the build. Like I said, if you want a really in-depth look at this case, you'll need to check out the air-cooled video. But for this video we are of course focused on water cooling, so let's take a look at the parts we're going to use for this build. First up is the radiator selection. This case can officially support a 240mm radiator, but like most cases, it doesn't specify what thickness of radiator. I have a couple of radiators available, one is an EKPE 38mm radiator, and the other is an EKSE 26mm radiator. We'll be looking to fit the 38mm radiator, and you'll see how that goes later, but if a case's specification doesn't specify a radiator thickness, and you can't find any solid answer anywhere else, it's best to go with a standard slim radiator with a thickness of around 30mm or less. The GPU for the system is an EVGA GTX 1070 for the win edition, but since it's a for the win edition, it's dressed up in an EK GTX 1080 water block because that's all that would fit. Which means the system appears to be more awesome than it actually is, but it's still pretty cool nonetheless. The CPU being cooled will be the i7-6700K, and we'll be strapping an EK Supremacy water block to it. One thing I noticed with the acrylic water block is that it seems to discolour very slightly over time when using pastel red coolant and probably other pastel coolants. I'm looking into some sort of effective solution for cleaning it up, and I may do a video on that in the future depending on what I find. The reservoir is where things get a little interesting. I've always used this D5 pump with the X3 104mm reservoir, but if you checked out the air-cooled video you'll already be well aware that this case requires a specific set of hardware to fit it all in. You can't just pick any power supply unit and graphics card and expect it to fit. So if we find the need to remove the reservoir completely then we have this pump top on standby. This wasn't bought for this build, but it's ready for many ITX watercool builds we'll be doing in the future. Stay tuned if you want to check out any of those. As for the tubing, this is something I don't normally mention. We're using 12x16mm soft tubing and there are already a few runs that have been reclaimed from previous builds. I can generally get away with using identical lengths from previous builds, or I can cut a previous one to fit. That is one of the huge benefits of soft tubing, but bear in mind that it will stain if you use coloured coolants after a matter of weeks. These lengths were reclaimed from clear water builds, so they remain nice and clear. As for the fittings, we have a pile of EK 12x16mm fittings with all sorts of angle adapters, T-splitters, plugs and even a ball valve for a drain port, which is seriously important. And of course there are a few sets of screws that have come from the pile of radiators. So preparing for the water cool build from the air cooled build, I thought I'd show you the dismantling process very quickly, since there are a few setup changes that are happening from the air cooled build. First off, I'm using a desk mat to build this on. I would 100% recommend using this with this case, or something soft like it. Anything that's soft and won't scratch the anodized finish of the aluminium panels. Don't use something that's fluffy to build on, but a smooth fabric surface will do just fine. I'm surprised nobody has had an issue with the placement of the drives on the back panel from the air-cooled build. However, this will be changing for this build. Instead of using three 2.5 inch drives, I'll be downgrading to two to the back of the motherboard tray so we can make the build look as clean as possible. In the past I've had a few questions from viewers about the LED lighting strips I used. These ones are from CableMod and these are wide beam magnetic LED 30cm lighting strips. I generally don't show them being installed in videos since the cables are generally a little difficult to cable manage cleanly. Pulling out the Hyper 212 EVO, this is where the pump res combo is planned to fit into, and with any luck it will go in without clashing with the power supply unit. The SFX power supply unit is new from the last build, and it was bought in so we could fit in a full-size graphics card. 
But of course we don't buy any single use parts around here and it will be pulling multiple duties in many future ITX builds. And lastly we need to take the top off and remove the current set of fans to both free up space for the building and allow us to work out the best way to install the radiator later. Okay, so we've dismantled the majority of the system ready to start building it up with water cooling gear. First off though, we need to establish the reservoir situation and unfortunately, it doesn't look promising to start with. But never fear, we always have a few aces up our sleeves. Due to the setup of the drives in the air-cooled build, the power supply unit's orientation is in the least space efficient position, so we can turn that around to start to then re-evaluate where we stand in regards to the reservoir. This change also has a secondary advantage. Since the drives are being relegated to the back of the motherboard tray, the SATA power connector on the power supply unit will now be following them towards the back of the case as well. So we can now retest the reservoir to see if it fits, and if it fits, it sits. So we're going to be going forward with the full reservoir. As for installing the CPU block, this is where I came across something that I hadn't picked up before. The full area of the CPU socket is not accessible through the rear of the motherboard tray cutout, so this means that the motherboard will need removing entirely from the case to install the CPU block. Now while this is a pain, it really doesn't take that long. Get yourself a ratchet screwdriver with a long shank and you'll have the motherboard out in less than a minute. Skipping past the removal of the rest of the Hyper 212 EVO's components, let's take a quick run through the installation of the CPU block. First off is the rubber gasket and steel backplate for the back of the motherboard. The front of the motherboard then takes these two-sided bolts which team up with the backplate to provide a secure mount to support the CPU block. Speaking of which, after a touch of thermal paste we can lower the CPU block down onto the CPU. And finally, a set of springs can be lowered over the bolts, these help with regulating the pressure on the CPU and the socket as a whole, and then the thumb screws are placed over the top. Then it can all be tightened down in a cross-like pattern. CPU water blocks are genuinely so much easier to install than a standard CPU air cooler, but I've never had any hands-on experience with an AIO cooler. I made the transition straight from air cooling to water cooling, so I have no ideas. So with the CPU block fully installed, we can reinstall the motherboard back into the case. Now here's something worth taking note of. If you're going to be using a Micro ATX motherboard in this case, then you do well to route the CPU power cable through the lower cable management hole prior to installing the motherboard. Once the motherboard is in position, it covers most of that hole, so you'll struggle to get anything much bigger than a fan connector through. So with all screws securing the motherboard in place, the CPU power and CPU fan hub can be connected, and then we can move on to the motherboard power. Now previously, I had this 24-pin motherboard power connector screwed up into a big mass of cables with the rest of the power cables in between the power supply unit and the CPU cooler. But since we're aiming for a much nicer looking build, and the reservoir is going to be occupying a massive part of the bottom of this case, that's no longer an option, so we've opted for this much more discreet route. As for the drives, since we've covered how they're installed in the previous video, we can simply populate the brackets like so, and move on to linking the SATA power cables to them. Now last video I covered the issues with the SATA connectors on the SF600 power supply unit, so since the connectors are linking to the drives at an angle, it's worth doing a test fit of the side panel just before we move on. We seem to be okay so far, so let's move on to that reservoir. Now this is a connection that I've had to make in quite a few cases. Generally I mount the pump right in front of the CPU block and create a short run of tubing between the two. But since the tolerances are so tight for this connection, the CPU block needs rotating to be able to create that straight link. It was close, but it was such a slight offset where not even a couple of 45 degree angle adapters could do the trick. These are the sort of things that will never be apparent when it comes to making a first build. Getting a sense of depth in comparison to the water cooling hardware is very hard to predict, especially when working on small scale builds, so expect to need more hardware than your plans predict. If like me, you have a connection that is so tight that you have no room for maneuverability or access, doing something like this, where you prepare both sides of a connection prior to connecting them and then force the two together with a stubby length of tubing can actually get you through some tight situations. In this situation, the fan needs packing out from the case to be able to support the pump to CPU connection properly, so there is a set with one steel washer to provide the platform for the two following rubber washers on a set of bolts that I had going spare. Due to accessibility reasons, I was unable to reach the bottom corner of the fan, so this unit is being held on by three sets of nuts, washers and bolts, and just so you know, the connection is solid.
Up next is the graphics card, and like any graphics card installation, this one was very straightforward. Of course, the connection to the pump below was a case of trial and error with all sorts of adapters and bits of tubing, but that comes with the territory of compact water cooling builds. As for the final and arguably most important part of the water cool build, the cooling element, or radiator, this is where we find out if the larger radiator can fit. To reduce the complication of the connection to the rest of the loop, the radiator is going below the fans. So we could hold the radiator with the fans balanced on top and then slot long screws through both the top panel and the fans to the radiator, but instead we're going to take the slightly easier approach and take two steps. First step is to secure the fans to the radiator with short screws. I always find whenever doing this that trying to align all the radiator screws with the fan screw holes is a nightmare. Here's something I find useful. I sometimes use long screws to guarantee the alignment, then I use short screws in all the other aligned holes to secure the alignment in place. And then I replace all long screws with short screws. So you end up with 8 connections between the fans and the radiator which is more than enough. Then the unit can be mounted to the top panel with 8 fan screws. While this is all being screwed into place, I was messing around with the fan the other day by partially covering up the intake side with my hand. It was interesting to see that at full speed, the fan, I think the Ryzen Tech one that came with this case, lost around 250 RPM of the 1300 RPM top speed, when it was set to run at full speed. This was extremely interesting to me since it brings up the topic of static pressure fans versus airflow optimized fans. Let me know in the comments if you're interested in seeing a video where we look into the strain on certain fans in certain scenarios. We could work out all percentages of fan speed lost due to certain environments. It's something that intrigues me but might not work for you guys. Let me know in the comments. As for the thermals, now the 38mm radiator was able to fit inside the case, but only barely due to the close proximity to the header connections on the motherboard at the top of the case. So if you're going to get a radiator any thicker than 30mm, don't go for anything wider than a 131mm radiator. Onto the results themselves, this radiator was able to handle the 1070 and the 6700K at full load for 10 minutes, which is pretty impressive. So after the 10 minute test, the CPU was averaging just over 76 degrees Celsius and the 1070 was at 54 degrees Celsius. Compare that to the other water cooled builds on this channel, you can regard this as the worst result to date, but this case was only sporting a single 240mm long, 38mm thick radiator, where most of the others had two 240mm, 26mm thick radiators. More interestingly though is the comparison to the Thermaltake Core P3 just below, which is my open air test bench. This should give you a good understanding of how much the filters and compartmentation of a system that a case provides can affect airflow. So, now we've covered the data, let's check out the final build. So there we have it, a water cooled build in the Raijin Tech Sticks. Thank you so much for checking this one out. Uh, one point I'd like to make very quickly uh, about the fan setup for this case. Considering it only has two intake fans and one exhaust fan, uh, technically you could call it one and a half, including the power supply unit. 
it actually needs more cooling than you would like or than you would need for the CPU and GPU alone. The CPU and GPU are completely fine uh, with just that one radiator, that's not a problem. But the power supply unit is a completely different issue. I was actually playing a few games on it uh, last night and there was a lot of fan noise coming from it and I was, I was thinking, well, I can't see the rear fan ramping up and it's linked to the two top fans so they won't be ramping up e uh, either. It actually turns out it was the power supply unit that was overcompensating for the lack of airflow going through. I had it on a very, very quiet fan curve. The, the fans wouldn't even engage until it was around 50 degrees C and only then they would come on very slowly, but that's not enough for the power supply unit and there was a lot of hot air gathering inside the case because obviously there's barely any exhaust fans going on. So what I would either recommend is that you have one of your intake fans that runs on a separate um, separate loop, a separate uh, cycle or, or fan curve to the rest of your fans and have that that goes a little bit earlier and stays relatively well on for relatively low temperature and then ramp it up later and then have the other fan ramp up later on as well and then have the exhaust fan linked to the one that that's ramping up later. At least then you'll have some intake coming in to supply some airflow through to that power supply unit. Otherwise it may overheat. It's not going to overheat. It's not going to get above 105 degrees C, which is the, the limit of the capacitors inside it, uh, at least for the Corsair series and many of the other higher quality power supply units out there. But that's a really important point I want to make. You need to get some airflow through, not just for the power, the power supply unit, of course, obviously for the motherboard and the hard drives uh, and all that sort of stuff. They all need some cooling as well. Uh, if not, just, you know, just something, just something to, to get them by. So that's really the major point I'd have about this case. I thought it was... Uh, a challenge to build in, definitely, uh, although it was absolutely fantastic throughout. I thought it was very enjoyable. I actually love the, the case as it is. Would I have it as a daily driver? Well, if I was going to have it as my permanent case for the next year or so, then probably. I think, yeah, I think it looks fantastic. And it's uh, a great little build on top of the case, not too big, very small for a Micro ATX case, and I would uh, fully recommend that. So if you're looking in the market for something that's quite stylish, small, uh, relatively good cooler, if you're looking to water cool it, then this would be the case for you, potentially. Put it on your list. So anyway, thanks for checking this video out. I really appreciate the support so far. We are aiming towards that, uh, the February uh, 20th mark to get this channel over a thousand subscribers, or we get demonetized. So if you loved the video enough or liked it enough, please consider subscribing to check out more in the future. Uh, if you want to support this video uh, or support this channel any more, then we do have a Patreon page. You can put a dollar per month for that. That would be fantastic. If not, just one dollar for one month and then cancel afterwards uh, as just a little tip. That would be fantastic. Uh, and if you want to communicate with me more specifically in the comments below and at the end of the video, at the end of the video and over on Facebook uh, and that sort of stuff, I've run out of words. I'm quite tired. So I'm going to head off, edit the rest of this video and I hope you enjoyed it. So I'll catch you in the next one, which will be the AeroCool 240 QS240. It's a, yeah, it'll be that one. <laughs> I'll see you next time, guys. Bye-bye.